come give us an introduction for Kelly, please. We welcome to our church this morning, Brother Kelly Reed. Again, welcome. We're glad to have you here. Brother Kelly has been uh, pastoring since 2001 churches in Missouri and Illinois, uh, most recently in Joliet, Illinois, uh, back in Murray now. Uh, as it says in your bulletin, they're currently seeking God's guidance for where and how to serve. Well, he's found it this morning. He blessed us in the first service, and I know he's going to be a blessing to you. Brother Kelly, come share God's word. Thank you. I did want to say just again, it is it's a joy to be able to come and uh, be able to share with uh, what God has been sharing with me and teaching me. Uh, it's, you know, haven't had as many opportunities of late to, to, to preach. And when, when you don't have the opportunity and God lays things on your heart, you want to be able to share it. And that's a, that's a great joy for me to be able to do that with you this morning. One of the things that I like to do when, when I come into Scripture, when I share things, I like to approach some of these stories that we, if you've been coming to church for a long time, you may have heard, you may have known for, for, you've known these stories a lot, you've heard them a lot. I like to try to approach them in a new and a fresh way to try to dig down a little bit deeper into them because so many times we've heard them so often that they no longer impact us the way that they should. And there are some powerful emotions in the story that we're looking at today and there's some principles that are involved in it that I wanted to share with you in this one story. There's so many things that we can learn. The first one is that, and see if you can try to picture out what story this is, what event in the life of Jesus this is, is that Jesus, he responds to the great and the small. You may be an important person. You may be, consider yourself an insignificant person. Jesus responds to both. Then you also, you'll see in this story how sometimes the best ministry, the most important ministry, is not the one that's planned. It's the one that comes in the interruptions. We also need to know that there are glimmers of hope that, that God lets us see, that he reveals to us, that prepare us for the difficult times. Because we all have the difficult times that come, and God wants us to be ready for them. Also need to know it is never too late to call out to God, to call up upon him. Then this one is the one that is often the most troubling and sometimes the most difficult to discern and to deal with is that not everyone speaks the truth in the midst of suffering, in the midst of difficulty. Sometimes those emotions, sometimes those, those anger and different things like that get in the way. So we need to really focus on Jesus and who he is and what he says to us. But we also need to know that Jesus when he comes and when he reveals himself, he comes to bring us life and restore our hope. So if, you'll, if you're thinking about where it might be, I want you to turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 5. And we'll begin to see these elements of the story come out. It's Mark chapter 5, verse 21. It says there just in verse 21, it says, When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Now, just as a reminder of, of where he is, Jesus had, in the days before this, he had just been so overwhelmed by the crowds and by the people pressing around him that he got on a boat and decided to go across the lake, and he was so tired that he fell asleep in the, in the, the, in the boat, and while the disciples were rowing, they were trying to make some headway, a great storm came up, and he slept through the, pretty much the whole thing. He was that tired, he was that wiped out. You know, his, in his humanity, he was, he was needing rest. And it was so, such a bad storm, the disciples feared for their lives, and so they, they woke him up and said, Jesus, don't you care that we're going to die? And he gets up and he does what? He, he, he rebukes the wind and the waves and everything calms down. He's going across so he can, he can get away and he can rest. And, and as the boat approaches the other shoreline, it's a Greek, it's a non-Jewish territory over there. And the welcoming committee for him there is not a massive crowd, but it's someone who is probably more dangerous than that. It's one man who is demon-possessed. He's, he's crazy. He is near doesn't have any clothes on. He has some, been someone who the other people have never been able to restrain. And he is there to meet him. And so Jesus has to con confront this man, confront this, these demons, cast them out. 
And then just after that is when he starts coming here. He's Jesus, he's going back home. They, they didn't want him to stay, you know, so he, he crosses back over by boat to the other side of the lake. He's coming back to the Jewish side of things, and there is a large crowd that's there waiting for him. They've been expecting him to come back. We pick up in verse 22. It says, Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came there. Seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him. My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. And so Jesus went with him. This is how we expect the world to work. An important man came into this crowd and met Jesus there. This is one of their synagogue rulers. He's important enough that we see him, we actually get to hear his name in the scriptures. That's recorded for us. But this important man, you know, who we'd expect Jesus to respond to, and the world will typically tell us, yeah, you pay attention to what the important people say. This man was broken. This man is desperate. He is coming to Jesus. He is falling at his feet. You don't typically expect somebody in his position, in his prominence, to respond like this. He falls at Jesus' feet and is pleading with him, is begging with him. And you find out why. His little girl, his daughter is dying. Please come. Please just lay your hands on her. Put your hands on her so she will be healed and live. He is desperate. I mean, I have been blessed with a nine-year-old son and a a five-year-old daughter. and, And I can't even imagine the, the pain and the difficulty that must be going through this man's life to know that his child is dying. And I'm, chances are somebody in this room has experienced that. And it, is, it can never be underestimated how difficult that is. And things had gotten so bad that this man, Jairus, he left his daughter's side to come and find the only hope that he had remaining to him. He had heard that Jesus was there, and he comes to get him. He, he leaves the hospital bed, so to speak, and comes to find him. That's how desperate he is. That's how important it is. So he falls at Jesus' feet. He talks about this urgent need, this desperate need that he has. Please come and, and, and bless her. Put your hands on her so she may live. And see, that's, a, that's part of his culture is one of, of blessing and the laying on hands and such as that. You see that over and over again in the, in the pages of Scripture. There's something that's important that happens with touch. A blessing is one that is a hands-on experience. And this is kind of a contrast to what you see in, in other parts of the Scripture where a centurion comes to Jesus and, and he asks for healing of, of a man's, uh, of his servant. And the centurion comes up to him, a Roman, a non-Jewish, who doesn't have that kind of culture of blessing in his life. He says, look, I understand. All you need to do is just say the word and my servant will be healed. He's healed, isn't he? Do you know that story? Jesus, he's not anywhere close by. He doesn't even have to go with him. He just says, you're, what, you're, what you say is done. You know, your, your servant will be healed, and the servant was healed from that moment. But this Jewish man, in this culture of blessing, wants Jesus to come and put his hands on his daughter and restore her and heal her. He sought this hands-on healing and blessing. And this very important man, Jesus responds, and Jesus goes with him. And a large crowd followed and pressed around him. So you have all of this crowd that, that was there that met him, you know, they are, they are going with him. They see, oh, yeah, Jairus, yeah, look, he's coming. He needs Jesus' help. I want to see, I want to be a part of that. I've got my own needs. I've got my own problems. And so they are going with him. They are pressing in around him. Some of the streets, they might be narrow. And what happens when you have, if any of you drive in a big city, when you have a whole bunch of people trying to fit through a small little space, what happens? It gets pretty crowded, doesn't it? What ha- how fa- does the traffic keep going at the same speed? What happens? 
everything slows down. Everything comes to a crawl, right? You've been sitting there for a couple of hours sometimes trying to fight your way through the traffic. Now, do you think that's something that Jairus is enjoying at that moment? Think about it. The crowd goes with him. He is, and he is desperate to get Jesus there. And there's this great big crowd that's in the way. And they're being, you know, maybe bottlenecked on some of these streets trying to get to his house. And everything is slowing things down. And it's his daughter who's waiting. His daughter who is dying. Anything, if anything, Jairus wants to get these people out of the way. You know, he, it's not that he doesn't care. I mean, he's a leader in the synagogue. He's got his issue his problem, his daughter that he is so concerned about. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And verse 25 says, And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. Now think about this. This is somebody who is not named in Scripture. This is a woman in town who is in many ways not as important as Jairus. This is essentially this, this woman, this small person in the, in the community. She is coming to Jesus. She sees she has been subject to bleeding. It says in verse 27, when, when she had heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his clothes because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. See, this woman had him endure, and endured suffering for 12 years. For 12 years, no one could help her. For 12 years, she had been praying and seeking after God, and there had been no answer, no healing, no response that she would be able to figure out. And in fact, it says that she was made worse. She suffered a great deal. She went to the, the, the doctors that she had available to her. She went for their help. And it didn't work. She spent everything she had. All the money. She was paying for this for herself. And this tells us a couple things. You know, this problem that she had was probably gyne gynecological in nature. It might have started when she was just a young girl. The money that she'd be spending would be the money that would be like a dowry, the money that she'd be taking into her marriage with her. But you know what? With this problem, she'd never be able to get married. Because what happens in this culture with these people, when someone is bleeding like that, it made them ceremonially, it made them unclean, it made them, they, they are not able to be touched unless they, they transfer that uncleanness or that that corruption on to whoever or whatever they touch. There'd be certain jobs that this woman couldn't have. There'd be people that she couldn't be around. Her family would be taking a risk every time they come near her. She wouldn't be allowed in crowds. When she comes, people would have to avoid her. She could get in trouble for being in the wrong places and for touching people, important people. They could persecute her for it. She had suffered a great deal, tried to get the best kind of care that she could. She had probably also gone to the religious leaders and say, look, is there a sacrifice I can do? Is there a prayer I need to pray? Is there some sort of ritual I can go through? Anything that can solve this problem. But instead of getting better, she grew worse. For 12 years, she had been suffering. And all she wanted to do is just kind of have this touch and go faith. Just kind of get in and get out and hope nobody notices. She heard about Jesus. She came up behind him to where nobody would see her, where she, she wouldn't be noticed in the crowd and touched his cloak, thinking if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. And verse 29 says, immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. See, there was this transference of uncleanness that she was worried about. She was afraid, and in coming and touching this important person like Jesus, she would be corrupting him. 
She doesn't want to get into trouble. It had happened before. In all likelihood, she had hoping to just get in and not be noticed. And here is something important that's happening. Jesus is going with Jairus. He's got an important agenda. He's trying to save this little girl's life. But along the way, that agenda, that, that interest was interrupted. And sometimes that best ministry does happen in the interruption because at once, verse 30, it says that at once Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. And he turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? And one thing that jumps out at me this week when I was looking at this is, is Jairus' perspective. He's already trying to push through the crowd. He's already trying to get things moving along so he can get Jesus to his daughter because he's already desperate. And what does Jesus do? He stops, turns around, and starts talking to somebody else. Do you think he's happy right now? Do you think he's... Okay, I'll just... Wait patiently here. I'm, I'm good. I'm no problem. It's not going to be any difficult. I'm, I've got plenty of time. Do you think that's his perspective? Not at all. He's kind of turning around. Like, you're, you're stopping? Um, yeah. My agenda. Over here. This is important. We've got to get this moving. The last thing he wants is another delay. And Jesus stops. He, she, he turns around to address this woman whom he probably knows. She had been in this community for how many years? For 12 years? She had been talking to anybody and everybody who might be able to help her, including religious leaders, including people like Jairus. And he's stopping for her. See, what's one of the attitudes and perspectives that, when, that even we sometimes have today, it manifests itself in different ways. But when someone is enduring suffering, when someone is going through hard times, there's a part of us that will always think, well, they must have done something to deserve that. There's some reason that God is not answering her prayer. There's some reason that, that she is not being responded to and not being healed. Jesus makes time for the great and the small. And we get frustrated with the interruptions. I mean, I know I'm just like that when I'm working. If I'm trying to get, if I have a task I'm trying to do and I keep getting phone calls that break in my, my work, I get frustrated with that. And it's nothing, anything this important. But Jesus sees opportunity and he sees need. And he stops what he's doing, his important thing that he's doing, to address this. And see, no matter what the issue, no matter who the person is, this is so important for us to keep in mind, is that Jesus will not ignore us. He will not just move right along because there's somebody more important to deal with. And see, look at how... The disciples are, you know, he, he turns around, he asks, you know, who touched my clothes? And in verse 31, the disciples are like, hey, you see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask who touched me? I mean, yeah, the disciples were trying to hurry things along too. Like, what are you stopping for? For the, You don't even know who did that. It's not that he didn't know. It's not that he didn't know what happened. I mean, she just touched his clothes and he knew. The way I've heard it put is like if you have, uh, if you go into the kitchen and you see your cookie jar is empty as a parent and you see one kid who, who is clean and the other kid has crumbs all over their shirt and you ask, okay, which one of you got into the cookies? Is it because you didn't know? It's because you're giving them a chance to respond, to say something, to do something. You know, we've got, there are so many times that we feel like we've got more important things to do. 
that there are, there are so many people with other agendas and they're maybe trying to push us around and trying to do, get us to do anything else. But so many times the, the best ministry happens in times of interruptions, when we don't plan for it, when we don't expect it. And why is he stopping? What does he see in this moment that he wants to address, that he wants to take care of? One of the first things that is really there is that he cares about her suffering. He really does care about the great and the small. He cares about what's happening in, this life, in her life. Verse 32 says, Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. He's not listening to his disciples who are trying to hurry him along. He's not listening to Jairus who's probably tapping his foot impatiently trying to get him to his daughter. It's not that they're wrong. It's just that Jesus sees something else has happening here. He cares about her suffering. In verse 33, Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came. She fell at his feet and trembling with fear told him the whole truth. Told him her story. Told him what her life was like. Told him what was going on. Told him what she was thinking. Told him how she had been healed and how she had been restored. Now she comes trembling. Why is she afraid? Because she wasn't supposed to be there. That whole idea of her being sick with this bleeding, being unclean. She wasn't supposed to touch people like that. She wasn't supposed to come into the crowd. She was probably expecting to get a rebuke. There were probably a lot of stares, a lot of mumbling, a lot of, uh, of pointing fingers as, what is she doing here? She doesn't deserve to be attention. She, doesn't, she shouldn't be even cl coming close to this holy man like Jesus. She's afraid. She tells the whole truth. Because she says, she knows in her body, it says that she's been healed. But you know, who's going to believe her? How does she prove that she's been healed? See, in, in, in order for her to return to society, in order for her to return to her, to her family, in order for her to have the hope of a future, of a life of any kind, you know, it has to be shown or proven that her healing would have to be verified by a, a priest or a leader in the synagogue. So many times, some, Jesus heals somebody and he says, go and you show yourself to the priest. You remember those moments? It's a testimony to them so their healing can be verified so they could, they could be declared whole, so they could be declared clean, and so they could return to worship. This woman wouldn't even have been allowed in church. She wouldn't have been allowed to come to, to synagogue or be a part of any type of life of faith because of her illness. But she would have to go and be, have this verified to a ruler in the synagogue who just happens to be right there standing, waiting for Jesus to get moving. Isn't it Jairus? Isn't it a ruler in the synagogue who would have the ability to verify that this woman has been healed for the entire community to know that she can actually come back and be a part and be restored to her family, maybe be restored to her husband, maybe be restored to, to a future to be even get married. Jairus was there to see that, to be a part of it, to witness that event. And Jesus says, what's, you know, it's, it's, it's not the synagogue leader who makes this pronouncement, it's Jesus. It's your faith has healed you. It's saved you. It has made you whole, ceremonially clean. And he says, go in peace. And when peace, it means literally, it means go in wholeness, go in oneness, be restored. You're not an outcast anymore. You're not on the fringes anymore. You can be in peace, set at one again. Jesus pronounces her clean for the entire crowd to see. It's out in the open so she can go home. 
She's restored to her community. Her banishment is over. Then the assumption of her guilt is ended. See, she didn't make Jesus unclean. The transference happened the other way. He actually made her clean. And what's also significant there, what does he call her? He says to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. This is the only time. This is the only moment in speaking to a, a, a woman, speaking personally with someone, that he ever calls them daughter. He speaks about daughters and, and family members and such like that in the generic sense, but in this personal address, this personal title, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. And that is so important. It's one of the things that, that God showed me this week that broke my heart. Is because of Jairus. You know, Jairus is concerned about who? He's concerned about his daughter. He's concerned about his 12 year old daughter. And if Jesus, it's like he's saying, you know, Jairus, I know you want me to get to your daughter, but I need to take care of mine. I need to take care of my daughter. Jairus, every single day that your daughter has been alive, this woman has been suffering. This is my daughter. I'm going to make time for her. I am going to restore her. I am going to heal her. See, so many times we can get focused on our agenda, focused on our own troubles, focused on our own problems, that we can't let God interrupt us we don't let him redirect us for someone else's need, for someone else's moment. And see, that's one of the dangers. We can get so focused on what we want. We can so fo get so focused on our, our prayers and our concerns that we're even what we're asking from God that I've, and this is a, something I've done before. You know, we can get embittered when we see God answer somebody else's prayer and not ours. You ever been there? You ever seen how God, you see someone who's struggling or having trouble and you see God work and move in a miraculous way and he's like, God, why haven't you done that with me yet? Why haven't you answered my prayer? This woman had been praying for 12 years. We have to be guard against that. And so many times God sees these, these moments, these interruptions, as he sees something bigger. He sees a different picture, something important, something vital that might be happening in someone's life, maybe even right next to you, and you might miss being a part of it. You might be greatly blessed by that moment. See, remember how Jairus, he came to Jesus. He was desperate. This woman is also desperate. Jairus had nowhere else to turn. Neither did this woman. She's also even destitute. See, Jairus needed this moment. As much as it was to verify this healing for this girl, Jairus needed something to, to remind him, receive, let him see the power of Jesus because it's a testimony to Jairus because Jairus was about to get his world destroyed. His feet were about to get knocked out from under him. Look at verse 35. He says, while Jesus was still speaking, those words are still hanging in the air. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some men came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. Now this is a party that was already on the way. They wouldn't have made it to the house anyway. They came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler, and they bring the absolute worst news that Jairus could ever hear. Your daughter, she's dead. And then they said, why bother the teacher anymore? In this moment, Jairus' world, it comes crashing down. The pain of a child, losing a child is bad enough. And, and I don't ever want to underestimate that or... or Never say how bad that is. 
But you know, it's, it's got to be even worse for him because his child has died and he's not even there. You know, he was supposed to be the one holding her. He was supposed to be the one comforting her and, and being the father to her that she needed. And then they come and just say, rather matter of fact, rather bluntly, hey, your daughter's dead. She's gone. And then they respond by saying, you don't need to bother him anymore with that. It's over. Hope, there is none. Why bother the teacher anymore? See, we need the glimmers of hope to prepare us for these difficult times. And we are tempted. We sometimes hear advice or we are tempted to think that we shouldn't bother God with our problems. We don't need to address that with Him anymore. And when we think that, you know, we're, we're thinking that, number one, that we are a bother to Him. But we're also really thinking that you don't think your prayer, you don't think you're bringing it to Him is going to make any difference. Because you feel like your hope is lost. But when the world does come crashing down, we need to remember that we have, what we have seen God do, those glimmers of hope sustain us. When it's our fear, when it's our, our despair, when that is screaming the loudest in our ears, that's what we need to remember what God has done, those glimmers of hope in our future. So many times in the Old Testament, you know, it sees when the Israelites are, are going astray or things are going wrong, he always comes back to them. He says, I am the Lord your God. I am the one who brought you up out of Egypt. I am the one who have done this for you. I have done that for you. And he has this long list of all of these things that God has done and prepared so they will remember. You are in this crisis right now. Don't forget what I have done. Don't focus on the problem, on this, on this fear, on this moment. Remember what you've already been through. What you've already seen. And have hope for what is coming. Remember is a very important word. Because see, Jesus knew that those men were coming with the bad news. That wasn't a surprise to him. He knew that Jesus, that Jairus, if he didn't have some glimmer of hope to sustain him, he knew that Jairus would probably give up and say, okay, I'll listen to that. I'm not going to bother you anymore, Jesus. But I love the way he says it in verse 36. Ignoring what they said. That's a huge phrase for me. Ignoring what they said, Jesus told the synagogue ruler, don't be afraid, just believe. See, they weren't speaking the truth. Yes, they were speaking the truth that she was dead. No, they were not speaking the truth that it was over. He ignored what they said. It's almost like you can see Jairus almost losing his composure, almost losing his ability to stand hearing their words willing to give up hope, and it's like Jesus grabs him by the shoulders and picks him back up, looks him straight in the eye and said, don't look at them, don't listen to them, look at me. Focus on me. Listen to what I'm telling you. Don't forget what you've just seen. This woman, you know, she's been bleeding for 12 years and now she is healed. Don't forget that. Don't lose sight of that. And no matter what you may feel, no matter what people may be saying, it is never too late to call on God. God never sees you as a bother. Do you believe that? He never sees you as a bother. Whether you are a great person, whether you are small, you know, insignificant, powerful in the world's eyes, He never sees you as a bother, whether you are old or whether you are young. Whether it's the first time you prayed for it, or whether it's the millionth time you've prayed for it. Don't ever think that you need to never bother Jesus or bother God with that anymore. Because see, not everyone speaks the truth in these moments of suffering. They weren't speaking the truth to him. How many of y'all have ever had those moments and experiences when someone in trying to say something nice, feeling like they think they should say something, 
They say exactly the worst thing you could possibly want to hear at that moment in those times of difficulty, in those times of pain. We feel like we should say something and we say exactly what they don't need in those moments. Ignoring what they said because Jesus knew what was true. Don't be afraid. Just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the home of the synagogue ruler, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. And he went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. That's a euphemism for, yes, she's, she's gone, but they think it's over. They think there's nobody coming back. But they laughed at him. See, they mocked him. They scorned that word because these people were very familiar with death. And they knew that she was gone. And see, Jairus' emotions, the emotions of these people that are there, they were all telling him it's over. But see, emotions are not always the best way to determine what to do. They can make us irrational, do or say crazy things. Our emotions can be manipulated. They can be erratic. They cannot be trusted. And people will often try to say something in times of grief. But we need to keep our eyes focused on Jesus, the truth of what God's word tells us and what his promises are. Because Jesus brings life and he restores our hope. Why all this commotion and this wailing? It's not over. The child is not dead but asleep. Then he puts them, says on in verse 40, after he put them all out, basically he kicks these people out, these professional mourners. First he ignored the message that they sent. Now he says, get out of the way. He's able to push this crowd out of the way. He took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him, went in where the child was, and he takes her, he took her by the hand, and he says to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. And immediately the girl stood up and walked around, and she was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. Even though they had just seen this woman healed, they had never seen anything like this. And he gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. So rather than make this a big public event, he's saying, keep this private. And he takes her by the hand. He speaks over her. He speaks that blessing over her. And that is such a touching, tender moment. He didn't have to touch her. He didn't have to take her hand. He could have just spoken and it would have been done. When you read the account in Luke, it says that Jesus' words there were, my, my child, I say to you, get up. See, D Jairus was concerned about his daughter, but this little girl was also Jesus' child, wasn't he? Wasn't she? He was concerned about her as well. And see, Jairus sees her healed at just a touch from Jesus. This girl was beyond reaching out like the woman had. This girl couldn't reach out for herself. Jesus reached into her life and touched her. And so that hope kindles ever brighter for his daughter. Luke describes it as saying her spirit returned. It had departed. It was gone. Jairus had his daughter back. He had his life back. Jesus brings to, comes to bring us our life and restore our hope. Even in the midst of tragedy, even in the midst of, of suffering and struggle. See, we need to understand. We are all like Jairus' daughter. Every single one of us, we are dead in our sins and our trespasses. And we can't reach out. We can't restore ourselves. We can't bring ourselves back to life. We need the healing touch of Jesus to wake us up and to give us new life. We're just like his daughter. 
But you know, we're also just like the bleeding woman because we may be dead in our trespasses and our sins, but we're still walking and moving around, going through life. But we're just like this bleeding woman because our sin, it causes our suffering. It causes our pain in our lives, in the lives of others. And in fact, when you hear how Isaiah describes it, even the good things that we do, even the righteousness that we try to, 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 to live by or to, to count on our credit, Isaiah describes it, even our righteousness is as filthy rags. Bloody rags is what that literally means. Our righteousness is just like that woman's suffering. It makes us unclean. And we, no amount of doctors, no amount of medicine or rituals or religion or drugs can cure our disease. And our sin, it tries to keep us isolated. It tries to keep us alone. It tries to keep us, make us embarrassed from reaching out and trying to reach and find Jesus. We're just like her. But if we reach out to him, he will make us clean. And you know, you may just be like her, that suffering woman, that it's been a long time that you've been struggling, that you've been praying, and you haven't been getting the answer that you were hoping for. You may be just like her. And it may be, you may be tempted to think, well, I don't need to bother with God, God, bother him with that again. He's heard it dozens of times. Never stop. Never stop hoping, never stop believing, never stop reaching out for him because he will make you whole. He you may be like Jairus and his wife. You may be in the position today where you are, you're, you're not the one suffering, you're not the one hurting. Maybe you're watching someone you love who is, who's struggling, who is hurting. Maybe you have lost a, a, a child. Maybe you've lost a loved one. And you know what that pain feels like. You need to, to remember what God has done for you. And you not lose hope of who he is. See, you may be one who has reached out in faith. And you've waited a long time for your miracle to come. Maybe you've seen others have their prayers answered and you're tempted to become angry or confused or hurt. Don't be afraid. Don't quit reaching out for him. Because many times you may not be hearing a no. You may be hearing a not yet. It's hard to tell the difference sometimes. For 12 years, this woman had been praying and seeking a miracle, but it was this moment that she was healed. It was for her. It was also for Jairus. We don't know why things go on as long as they do, but we don't ever need to make the mistake of thinking that God is not aware or that he does not care. We may be hearing a not yet. We don't always like those answers. Because, see, you know, Jesus once asked a question regarding those who had been forgiven a debt. One had been, had this great debt that he knew he could never pay, and the man said, it's gone. The other one had a small debt that he could pay back in a little while, and the, and the guy who he owed it to said, it's gone. And Jesus asked the question, which one do you think loved the man more? And the answer was, well, the one who had had the larger debt forgiven. I want to pose a similar question to you as far as a demonstration of faith. And we sang, actually sang about it earlier when we sang the song, Blessed Be Your Name. So many times it is a, gr it is a great demonstration of faith. I don't want to belittle this or, or make it seem like it's insignificant at all. When, when God answers your prayer in a powerful, miraculous way and you're able to hold up your hands and testify and exalt the name of God and praise Him for what He has done, that is a great and powerful moment and testimony of faith. I hope you know and believe that. But you also need to know that it is a powerful 
testimony uh, and demonstration of faith in the same way that can you praise God? Can you lift up your hands and exalt Him for who He is when the miracle does not come? When the prayer is not answered? When it's one of those that is a not yet and you don't have it right before you, you don't get to see the miracle happen in that moment. Are you still going to be able to say whether He saves us from this fire or not, I will still praise the name of my God. That is a powerful demonstration of faith to where you don't quit. You don't give up. You keep reaching out to Jesus with hope, knowing that He hears, knowing that He responds to great and small, knowing that He does things on a different agenda, even in the interruption, knowing that he is, what He has shown you in the past can give you strength to, to support you in the difficult times. It's never too late to call out on Him. And while some people may mean well or there's lots of books to say one thing or the other, we need to always look and focus on Jesus in our suffering and our struggles because He does bring us life. He does restore us to wholeness. He does restore us to completeness, to where we can walk and go into our homes and our families with hope. I don't know where you are today. You may find yourself in various places in this story. In any way, in any, way, in any event, respond to Him. Let Him move in your heart. Praise Him. Reach out to Him. Because He is here to restore and heal you and give you hope. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we are also your child. I thank you that you made time for Jairus and his daughter. I thank you that you made time for this woman who had been an outcast. I thank you, Lord, that you make time for us here today. I know that there are people in this room who are hurting and who are struggling, who are suffering, and they are waiting for a touch from you, for power to go out from you. Lord, I pray that you would answer them. I pray that you would heal. I pray that you would restore and make whole. I pray that you would give hope. And Lord, if that answer for prayer is a not yet, Give us endurance and strength to keep our eyes focused on you, to never lose hope, to call out to you. Lord, you are worthy, worthy of all of our praise. And we seek your presence in our lives. We thank you for your word and for its testimony. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to be singing... A song of invitation. It's not just a song to, to get saved or to come and ask Jesus into your life. If there is just a burden that you have that you want to lay down, and it may be the first time, it may be the hundredth time, you just want to lay it down, that's okay. You can do that. So we can stand together and sing. And if you feel like God is leading you to respond in some way, it's free and open to you. Thank you.